This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. I'm Emma Keelan, taking a closer look at the three recent missions to Mars, what they're looking for and why they all arrived together. And I'm Shanice O'Mara, learning about a simple device that's designed to be used at home that could change the way we screen breast cancer. NASA's Perseverance pierced the Martian atmosphere at 12,000 miles per hour. And so began the seven minutes of terror when contact was lost. Until... Perseverance has now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. The sky maneuver has started, about 20 meters off the surface. Touchdown confirmed. Yeah. Perseverance yeah. safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. The first two images to be sent were taken by low-resolution hazard cameras. It took nearly seven months, covering 293 million miles, before a complex series of manoeuvres brought the Perseverance rover, the biggest, most advanced and ambitious of nearly 20 US missions to Mars, safely to the surface. You know, this mission is amazing on its own. Science, technology, and caching samples to bring back to Earth. But it's also part of our bigger exploration plans, right? Which involve really understanding Mars and the evolution of Mars and whether there was life, ancient life, um, but also preparing uh, for eventual human missions to Mars. And so the Perseverance rover's two-year mission on Mars begins. But this time, America is not the only country taking a closer look, with the United Arab Emirates and China taking a giant leap for their space programs. I think the U.S. space program, you know, those of us who are in it are, are welcoming some, some healthy competition. Different space programs are going to try different approaches. Having a different player out there with a different group and just trying different things is very important for progress. But why three missions all at once? Well, it's all to do with orbits. Mars and Earth only come close enough every two to three years to allow for travel times as short as six to nine months. The last time three missions were launched was mid-2003. The US Spirit and Opportunity rovers landed in January 2004, but the UK's Beagle 2 fell silent after entering the atmosphere. Perseverance is the fifth rover NASA has sent to Mars. This time the target is the Jezero Crater, a rocky location that needs a precise landing system to avoid crashing. It's going to be landing in a much smaller circle, in a safe location, but close to a place which is very interesting because it's a former riverbed, a place where we've seen flowing water billions of years ago leave a basically a delta of rocks and interesting geology, but also possibly signs of life in the past. Professor Mark McCochran is the senior science advisor at the European Space Agency. How will NASA's mission with Perseverance rover, how will it differ from previous missions? 
The Perseverance rover is effectively a copy in terms of the technology of the mission used for, which is called Curiosity, which is currently roving around in a place called Gale Crater. That landed in 2012, and the Perseverance rover is a copy of the chassis and the wheels and the sort of the, the overall system and the landing system, which is very clever and complicated. But it's got different scientific instruments on board, complementary to the ones uh, at uh, Gale Crater. For a start, it has two microphones, so we can hear the sounds of Mars for the first time. And there's also an experiment on board called MOXIE. MOXIE stands for the Mars Oxygen ISRU Experiment. And so what we're doing is we're demonstrating technologies that would be used to generate oxygen on the surface of Mars. The electrolysis system operates at 800 degrees Celsius, which reacts to the CO2 with a catalyst and generates oxygen, which separates it out from the CO2 gas. It's all very exciting stuff for engineers like Professor Christopher Welch. Can we extract oxygen from the carbon dioxide that makes up Mars' atmosphere? And that's what the MOXIE experiment on board the rover is going to do. It's going to try and extract, you know, or create oxygen at a certain level of purity as a, as a sort of proof that it can be done. So that maybe in the future we could make oxygen which could be used either for future humans on Mars or it could be used as an oxidizer for rocket propulsion. It is in fact actually gold. Gold is a very efficient reflector of infrared heat and because we have this very hot electrolysis system inside, we wanted to make sure that we didn't radiate heat onto any of the other things around us within the rover. Another first is Ingenuity, which will attempt the first ever powered flight on another planet. It must cope with temperatures of minus 90 degrees Celsius and is powered by innovative solar cells and batteries. To achieve flight in the thin atmosphere, Ingenuity weighs only 1.8 kilograms and has carbon fiber blades arranged into two rotors that spin in opposite directions at around 2,400 RPM, many times faster than a helicopter on Earth. You can't fly it in real time because of the communication lag between the Earth and Mars, so it has to be autonomous. And uh, it's going to be used effectively to kind of reconnoitre future routes for the rover. So the plan is a couple of times a day, this little helicopter will take off and uh, autonomously fly a route, you know, look what's coming up for the rover. The flights won't last very long, maybe three, four minutes, uh, and then it will come back and, uh, and recharge, and then they will analyse the footage and decide where to send the rover. Watching from above and taking pictures like these will be the Hope Orbiter, the United Arab Emirates' first interplanetary mission that will start to build the most complete picture of the Martian atmosphere that we've ever had. It's an instance of the UAE's attempt to change itself from a country which is very dependent on oil revenue into you know, a knowledge-based uh, economy. And in order to do this, they need to persuade many more of their citizens to get involved in scientific and technical subjects. Hope has joined other Mars orbiters from America, Europe and India. So what they've decided to do with the HOPE mission is actually stand a little bit further back from Mars and try to get a more synoptic view of the weather. So if you like, a meteorological satellite for the world looking at Mars. And that's fascinating because there's lots of things we still don't understand about the way the Martian atmosphere works. For example, how the big dust storms come up every couple of years and cover the whole planet and then go away again. So I think they're gonna do some very interesting complementary science from the high orbit that they're going into. They've specifically chosen it to complement what everybody else is doing. So we'll be getting understandings of the lower atmosphere and the upper atmosphere and that requires spectra from infrared spectrometer that we have on board. We also have visible images of Mars and at the same time we also measure the hydrogen and oxygen halo of Mars using ultraviolet. So it's a mix of data and also images that scientists use in conjunction to get their scientific discoveries and observations. 
Hope was the first of the missions to arrive in Mars orbit on the 9th of February. And a day later, it was the turn of China's Tianwen-1, or Questions to Heaven. The independent mission is a daring one, consisting of an orbiter, lander and rover. The China mission is very ambitious. Is this quite symbolic of their space program? You know, we're all China watchers when it comes to space. They're doing very impressive things. So we shouldn't really be amazed and surprised, but the progress has been astonishing. The things that they've done, putting their own astronauts into space, building space stations, doing things which have been done before, of course, with robots, but also doing things that haven't been done before, like the Chang'e 4 mission, which landed on the far side of the moon for the first time. Nobody's done that before. Despite the tense political relationship between China and America, it's nothing like the Cold War standoff with the US and Russia. Let me just show you something, because I was about to reach back for it. Yes, please. But as Dr. Robert Zubrin points out, they still celebrated each other's achievements in space. This is Time magazine from April 21st, 1961. And that is Yuri Gagarin. This is the picture uh, not of a villain, but of a, of a hero, right? Science has always been bigger than national rivalries, and Dr. Zubrin sees China's ambitious program as beneficial for all humankind. China could definitely shake things up, and, uh, and I believe, frankly, in a positive way, uh, because, uh, I mean, <laughs> the worst thing the Soviets ever did to the American space program was quit. Uh, the <laughs> So long as they were in the game, we were moving. Budget constraints were one of the reasons China decided to push the limits of their first ever mission to Mars, according to Xu Yansong. For more than 30 years, he worked for China's National Space Administration. They say Mars mission has never been a successful mission for the first trier. So we're looking forward to see if this one is a, is a go or not. And the next step, for the Mars mission is a more ambitious Mars sample return mission. So this is also robotic-based missions, uh, but we're uh, looking forward to, to get um, collect more parameters and more uh, data from this mission and where the future mission can be based on. The Tianwen-1 orbiter will spend time surveying the landing site at Utopia Planitia, where a NASA Viking mission landed in the 1970s. It's relatively flat and free of big boulders. We will take, uh, let's say, three or four months to adjust, to communicate, to rendezvous and to maneuver the spacecraft into the appropriate orbit and also imaging the Mars surface and to maximize the best potential landing site. If all goes to plan, China will become the third country after the United States and Russia to achieve a soft landing and the second to deploy a rover. While Tianwen-1 will repeat things that have been done before, this mission's technology and techniques are new. The solar-powered rover will explore the surface for 92 Martian days, each of which is equivalent to a day and 37 minutes on Earth. The six onboard instruments will seek signs of life, including any subsurface water and ice. It's going to have a ground-penetrating radar to look down the surface, under the surface. It's going to measure the magnetic field and the weather. It's going to you know, measure chemical compounds. And of course, it's going to take uh, lots and lots of uh, interesting photos. But unlike SpaceX's Elon Musk and others, China does not want to send astronauts to Mars. And one of my favorite movie is Martian. And uh, I know that um, lots of country and a lot of people are looking forward to go to Mars. Um, but there are lots of challenges. Uh, I think uh, Moon would be the first step for our manned mission. But before that, we have to construct the Chinese space station to validate many things. And then in 10 years, landing on the Moon, which is based on the heavy lifting launch vehicle. And then for Mars and other planetary, we will have robotic missions. Chinese missions basically for exploration project would have two folds. One is engineering purpose, another is scientific purpose. Unlike European uh, countries, they base their project on scientific missions. 
but the Chinese would have more technical challenges to archive some of the technologies and save the technologies for future use. The European Space Agency, or ESA, is not collaborating with China on this mission, although it is interested in any scientific discoveries. But it is working with NASA to bring back samples collected by Perseverance. It's designed to drill into the surface and pick up samples, put them in small tubes, which will be sealed, and left on the surface. And the point of that is that we, the European Space Agency, are working with NASA on a program called Mars Sample Return, where we'll actually fly back to the same location, a NASA spacecraft will take us down to the surface. An ESA rover will then run around on the surface and go to the locations where those samples have been left by Perseverance, bring them back to the landing platform, put them on a rocket, fire that into orbit, where a European spacecraft will pick the samples up and bring them back to Earth for much more comprehensive scientific analysis than anything we could do in situ on Mars. So Perseverance is the first step of a much more ambitious program, Mars Sample Return. So that's really exciting for all of us. But that won't be until the end of the decade, which means the European Space Agency has a chance to find signs of life on Mars before NASA. Their ExoMars mission was also supposed to be landing on Mars around this time, but had to be postponed. So if it launches next year, it's hoped the Rosalind Franklin rover will land in 2023 and put her long drill to work and also analyse some samples on board. Is there a chance that NASA could find out whether there is life on Mars before you can get your rover there? I mean, are they able to analyse anything at all inside the Perseverance rover? NASA Perseverance rover has some capability in that regard, but it doesn't have that complicated biology lab and it won't be drilling two meters underground. So if they, for example, were to stumble on fossils of trilobites or uh, dinosaurs, I'm sure they, they would get there first. But we believe that any life on Mars is going to be much more primitive than that historically billions of years ago or still there today. The International Space Exploration family continues to grow and with more people come more ideas to add more pieces to our solar system puzzle. It's always the case that there's a better idea out there, but someone's got to be willing to try it. You can see more of Razor on our YouTube channel. Search for Razor Science Show and it will take you straight there. Remember to subscribe and hit the bell button for notifications. There's more to this place than just glorious landscapes. There's more to it than just say Table Mountain or glorious, endless salt flats. There's more to it than countries that are home to some of the deepest minds in the world. There is so much more to this place, even if it is home to some of the finest diamonds on the planet. It is the sheer diversity of the people who call South Africa home and the relentless drive to make it a better place that make it so special. And we know that because this too is home. No one knows South Africa like we do. CGTN, see the difference. Covering the world from four continents, a new horizon. Teams in Beijing, Washington DC, Nairobi and London. Who connect, interact and inquire to bring you the stories that matter to all. The Link, only on CGTN. On the agenda with me, Stephen Cole, we look up into space. We look down into data. We look at debt. We look at politics. We look at opioids, climate change. 
We look at all the issues that really matter around the world. But you matter too. We want to tell the stories you want to see and hear about. Make it your agenda. science, behind-the-scenes insights, groundbreaking research and even some fun, check out our Razor podcast. Search Razor Sounds on all major streaming platforms and remember to subscribe so you don't miss out on any episodes. One in every eight women have breast cancer at some point in their lives. The good news is that it's a highly treatable disease and many make a good recovery. The trick is catching it early, something that humans are less successful at, but that dogs manage to do with a spooky level of accuracy. We meet a scientist who was determined to take that super sniffing technology and make it accessible to everyone. I believe that there is a need for those diseases that mainly affect the female population to be taken into account. Hello, today we're doing a small trip into the mountains. <laughs> Judith Jiro Burnett is a biochemical engineer and she's on a mission to give women control over their own health. She's just 23 and still at university, but she's designed a home testing kit that aims to change the way breast cancer is screened. For me, being a woman who is a biomedical engineer, seeing that this is happening in my field, this uh, started kind of a frustration in me when I was studying in the university. When I heard about the statistics about breast cancer, I saw an opportunity to turn this frustration into a potential solution. And it all started with some dogs that came into her undergraduate course. Some doctors came to my university and they started explaining a study that they were carrying out. Um, they had a dog that was able to smell the breath of patients and the dog would bark if the patient had breast cancer. That inspired me a lot because once again it was proof that sometimes the solution for these worldwide problems is already invented by nature. The problem that Judith Giro Burnett had recognised is that while breast cancer is treatable, not enough women catch it early enough, and the dominant method for screening, the mammogram, she feels could be improved upon. Mammograms are painful, they are uncomfortable, they are not convenient at all, which is one of the main reasons why a lot of women are skipping mammogram-based screenings. In addition, the chance of getting a false positive mammogram test is very high, with roughly half of women who screen regularly getting one at some point. This is a huge amount of anxiety that we are every year causing to women, telling them that they might have breast cancer and they need to go to the hospital again for a second exam. And in the end, it's just a benign lump. So there is a need for a solution for breast cancer prevention that first asks women, what do you need? And then develops that. Once this problem was recognised, the next step was to mimic what sniffer dogs do by building what's known as an e-nose. I thought, if a dog can detect breast cancer, maybe my Arduino and some sensors can also do it, right? An Arduino board is a simple microprocessor that uses open source software and hardware. It can read an input and turn it into an output. In this case, the hardware was connected to a sensor and programmed to detect the particular biomarker that the dogs were responding to. We collected 90 urine samples from breast cancer patients and from control at healthy subjects. And the sensitivity of the device was 75%. Sensitivity measures the probability of actual positives in a test. Judith Giro Burnett wanted to push that number higher, so she enrolled in a master's at the University of California. 
With the support of mentors, she was able to add AI to her testing system, and this was the game changer. The amazing thing here was that just by adding artificial intelligence into this device, the classification rate um, changed dramatically. And now our classification rate is over 95%, which means that more than 95% of the, of the samples analyzed are properly classified. So how exactly does it work? What's happening in that box? So your family would have one blue box at home and all the women in your family would be able to use it. The only thing you would need to do is to collect one urine sample in one container, just like this one, and introduce it inside the blue box. What happened next is all automatic. You don't need to worry about it. Inside the blue box, there are some sensors that are specific for some, bio, some biochemical molecules that are present in urine. But their presence or their absence determine breast cancer. Cancer alters aspects of the body resulting in certain biological molecules, known as biomarkers, being formed in bodily fluids. These molecules will eventually leave the body via various pathways, such as the urinary tract. Similar to the way sniffer dogs sense lung cancer from patients' breath, the sensors inside the blue box are tuned to react to specific breast cancer biomarkers found in urine. AI can spot those biomarkers and draw conclusions that could not have been reached using human intelligence alone. The exact biomarkers used in the blue box are commercially sensitive. The signal recorded by these sensors will be processed or pre-processed by an Arduino that is inside, and then it will be sent via Bluetooth to your phone. Your phone will send the results to the cloud, where our artificial intelligence algorithm is hosted. So, in just some minutes, you will get a diagnosis in your phone. The AI was trained to detect late-stage cancer with large tumours which produce a lot more biomarkers. In order to be an effective screening tool, the blue box will need to detect early-stage breast cancer. We are planning to start another round of clinical studies very, very soon. We're going to go to hospitals and collect urine samples from women that the same day that they are diagnosed with breast cancer, really, really early stage. And if we get enough of these samples, we'll be able to train the blue box to detect breast cancer in an early stage. And then we will be able to say the blue box is a breast cancer prevention tool. Amazing. Is this the only type of cancer the box can detect? So the only limitation of this algorithm is how many samples, how many urine samples are we going to be able to get? If we are able to, tra to train the blue box with uh, urine samples from patients that have multiple human conditions, I'm confident to say that the blue box might be, in the future, might be able to detect other types of cancer but so far only metastatic breast cancer. Around a year into the project, it took on a very personal tone for Judith, as her mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. That was once again a reminder that breast cancer is in every home, that this is a problem that we need to take seriously, and we need to provide a better solution for, for women. And, well, now my mom is perfectly fine, and I'm incredibly motivated to continue together with Billy pursuing this, this goal. Since the Blue Box technology is still in development, Judith Giro Burnett is keen to make the point that mammograms shouldn't be skipped. Today we're having a family lunch all together because it's like the name day of my mom. So that's a perfect excuse to gather all together and have some barbecuing. The mammogram is the best technology we have now. The mammogram saves lives. So I think this is a clear statement that we need a better solution and this is what we are trying to do. So are these types of devices using AI the future of healthcare? I would say the medicine of the future is this medicine in which technology and doctors work together. I would like the blue box to be a tool or an agent of change, something that is changing medicine of the future, something that is turning traditional curative medicine into a futuristic preventive medicine.